Today we take the most powerful multi-role warship in the Russian Navy and compare it to the U.S. Navy's most modern destroyer. How will the Russian behemoth Peter the Great fare against America's most advanced destroyer? This is a tale of modernization and maintenance, like you should modernize and maintain your mind with better help. This is a very important sponsor to me because I began my own therapy years ago and it changed my life for the better. Because I was sick, I didn't recognize my own issues. I needed someone else to hold up a metaphorical mirror to me so I could understand how to become a better, happier person. BetterHelp connects you with a licensed therapist who is trained to listen and give helpful, unbiased advice. To get started, you fill out a questionnaire like this, help assess your specific needs, and then you get matched with your therapist, in most cases, within 48 hours. You'll be able to schedule therapy sessions at any time that's convenient for you. And starting therapy can be daunting for some people who are not comfortable with face-to-face -face interaction, like this guy. BetterHelp therapy sessions are available via messaging. Or you can video chat or phone call. You can use whatever method you prefer. The choice is yours. BetterHelp will connect you with their network of over 30,000 therapists. This gives you a wider range of expertise to choose from. And if your first therapist isn't right for you, you can easily switch to another therapist at no cost without stressing about, is this gonna impact your insurance or are they in your network or anything like that? If you think you might benefit from therapy, consider BetterHelp. Click the link in the description or visit betterhelp.com forward slash subbrief. All right, Peter the Great, look at this beautiful ship. This is quite, Soviet era naval engineering has always been gorgeous to me. I've always appreciated what the Soviet Union built for their Navy. It, these things look like warships and I am a fan of their, of their architecture and engineering. But this is an unbiased review in my opinion. No, it's not, it's not unbiased at all. I love this thing. Okay, this is the Kirov class, a uh, nuclear battle cruiser, but it performs a multi-role mission like a destroyer. So we're gonna use this as a destroyer to destroyer comparison because by today's definition, a multi-role warship is a destroyer regardless of size. So comparing this to America's best destroyer is I think a fair one-to-one -one comparison in terms of mission capability. So this is the largest, most capable large combatant in the Russian Navy even today. So I'll be using this for our comparison. She was commissioned back in 1998, but that means that she was a product of the 1980s, the Soviet Union era. This is actually peak Soviet Union naval technology using a lot of uh, 70s and even 60s ideas, 1960s ideas that were developed in the 70s and then built in the 80s. And then after the collapse of the Soviet Union, not commissioned until 1998. So powering this huge ship are two KN3 nuclear reactors and two boilers. This is a very unique uh, power plant where you have nuclear reactors and fuel oil boilers working together or independently. That's right. So together uh, they can produce 90,000 horsepower, which is a lot of horsepower, to push 26,000 tons of ship up to 30 knots. Now, because she has two completely independent power plants that can work together, if she just uses her nuclear reactors, she can push the ship to 24 knots, maintain that speed indefinitely because it's nuclear. Or if they only want to use the fuel boiler side, they can push the ship to 17 knots until they run out of fuel. Now let's talk about sensors here. There are so many sensors on the Kirov. It's one of the things that makes it special. This thing is an absolute buffet of Soviet Union naval technology when she came out. At the top, we have top pair, which is actually two completely different radars that work together in the same system. It is top sail and big net. And this is a huge correction. There's a lot of websites on the internet that get this wrong. I'm making the correction here and now. Top pair is top sail and big net and nothing else. All right. Now, top plate is the plate looking radar right below that. And that's used for surface search. Below these two radar systems are all the fire control systems. Big dome is the big round looking one right below it. Used for fire control to control surface air missiles, guiding them to their targets. 
just like Pop Group and Kite Screech do similar missions, but all for different weapon systems, but surface air uh, missiles. Cross Swords is the one here at the bottom, and this directs one thing, this gun down here. This uh, large 130 caliber, 130 millimeter gun, rather, uh, turret is controlled by Cross Swords. And all these systems are linked via a combat control system called Lessa Rub 44. They can track dozens of targets, which was the standard of the time, and engage multiple targets at all ranges using these different systems. There is, however, a problem here. These systems often interfere with each other when operated simultaneously. Even though they each have different uh, electromagnetic spectrum bands that they operate in and different power levels, whenever they operate at the same time, you see striping, interference patterns, and other things that would reduce the effectiveness in tracking and detecting, frankly, uh, contacts at range. So even though this is a great system with multiple failbacks, if one system gets damaged, another one can still operate. When you operate them together, they do not operate optimally because of many factors, including interference with each other. Also, these radars are all exposed to the elements and more importantly, in conflict, battle damage. The very first high explosive warhead that goes off anywhere near the superstructure is going to shred these radars. These are very fragile radar arrays and it doesn't take much to disable them. Next is the horse jaw sonar system. This sonar system was the one sonar system that when I went against it personally, I was seriously concerned about counter detection. This thing is extremely high power. This thing has killed more fish than the Chinese fishing fleet has. It has a very long range in deep water and shockingly a very effective shallow water mode. It can be very precise and dainty when it wants to be, but being Russian and Soviet, it is very loud and powerful and can insonify a large volume of ocean all the way around it in deep water. Uh, I have gone, gone I, I've planned against this sonar system multiple times in my career, and it is very concerning to the U.S. Navy how good it is. And this sonar system on board the Peter the Great was upgraded in 2014. It's still horse jaw, it's just modernized horse jaw. Now let's talk about weapons. Man, the Kirov's got some weapons. Let's start right here on the bow right here. This is the SAN-9 Gauntlet 64 VLS of these surface air missiles. Now the Gauntlet debuted in 1986. Uh, it's an old missile system, but she's been modernized over the years and they have 64 of them on the bow here. Behind that is 12 Fort M, M for modernized or FM, SAMs, surface air missiles. Again, these were uh, initially released in 1984 for the Navy, because there's many different variants of this missile. This one originated in 1984 and was modernized recently to keep up with 21st century technology. Now, one that was not modernized and is still the original missile is the P-700 Granite Shipwreck, and there's 20 of them. This is the primary anti-ship armament on board this ship, and keep in mind it only has 20 of these missiles. Once these missiles are gone, this thing is an air defense destroyer and a gunboat and nothing more. And behind that in red, we have the OSA-M, which is a modernized SAN-4 Gecko short range point defense missile. Uh, sidebar here, this is the missile system that failed the Slava, failed to defend the Slava in the Black Sea when she was sunk by Ukraine Neptune anti-ship cruise missiles. So. Hopefully the one on the Peter Great works better than the one on the Slava did, right? Now around the ship, and you can see two here in this picture, are close in weapon systems. And those are strictly point defense. They do use both uh, short range uh, missiles and ballistic guns to uh, engage close in threats, whether it's a cruise missile or low flying aircraft that are very close. The aft end of this ship has even more weapons. Uh, the big thing on the back is the AK-130 turret. It is a twin 130 millimeter gun that can shoot 70 rounds a minute downrange to a range of 12 nautical miles. And 70 rounds a minute of 130 millimeter shells will eviscerate anything that it hits. You don't want to get within 12 miles of this thing and be a target because this gun will certainly lay down some firepower on you. The key is to stay out of that range, honestly. Now, Behind that are two sets of VLS cells. These are circular rotary cells that launch the Kinzel short range 
point defense, if you will, surface-to-air missile. So they have multiple uh, point defense systems ballistically along the ship and mi point defense missile systems forward and aft. The aft ones are kind of hard to see in this picture, but they're little rotary uh, launchers that sh shoot a Kinzel missile. Highlighted in green here are torpedo tubes. They have five fixed torpedo tubes on each side, total of 10, that can uh, engage any kind of nearby submarine. Like I said, this is a multi-role ship. It does anti-air defense and, you know, air area denial. It also does anti-ship warfare and anti-submarine warfare all at the same time. Now, Peter the Great is complemented with helicopter support like today's uh, destroyer as well on the American side. It can do multiple missions, like I said. Uh, the Kirov really is just a testament to peak Soviet Cold War naval technology. But today, in 2024, it really just parades all these archaic systems around the Barents Sea every summer. That's right. Every summer, this thing goes out for a naval exercise near Norway. It is essentially the Kaiser's yacht who would visit Norway every summer. Well, so does the Kirov now, and they call it a naval exercise. And uh, she's been doing that for the past couple of years and nothing else. So it's clear that she can still go to sea. It's not clear what works and what doesn't. And it's not clear how long she can stay at sea. So what is this right here? What are we looking at? This is the United States Navy Arleigh Burke Flight 3 series of ships. This one has been commissioned starting in 2023 and going forward. We've paid for nine of these. We have two right now. They're building the rest. Uh, there's plans to build 11 total of this flight of ship. And that may continue, or they may just design a flight for who knows. But right now, uh, the numbers are we have two. We paid for nine. We're planning on making 11 total of these. Now this ship comes in, this destroyer comes in at just under 10,000 tons. That's two and a half times lighter than the Kirov. So what makes that significant is this right here. She's powered by four LM 2530 gas turbines that when working together produce a hundred thousand shaft horsepower, pushing a 10,000 ton ship, which means on paper, Unclassified public numbers mean she can go 25 knots, but I'm here to tell you that that number is just what we're allowed to say at this point. But she is very fast. She gets to that 25 plus knots in a hurry, folks, because she's got so much power pushing such a light ship up to those speeds. It's, uh, it's really incredible. Now, another thing about this ship that is very different than the Kirov is its startup time. This ship can be sitting in Norfolk overnight with just the overnight watch on board, get the call to go underway right now with whoever's on board and it can power up and be casting off lines in about 20 minutes. It can be going out into the Atlantic within an hour. Whereas the Kirov, whether it's the nuclear reactor or the oil fed boilers is gonna take hours to get up to temperature and pressure to even think about casting off lines and getting underway. She is a rapid response destroyer. And that's a testament to the design. These gas turbine engines can spin up and begin producing electricity and propulsion rapidly. And that is really the heart of what makes this ship special. Now. What makes the Flight 3 different than Flight 2 or the other flights of the Arleigh Burke is its major sensor package upgrade. Now, let's begin with Aegis Baseline 10. Aegis Baseline 10 is the system that connects all these sensors together. And this gives the SPY-6 uh, radar system the ability to detect stealthy high-speed targets uh, at all altitudes to very long ranges as well as enhancing security of that network. It can share this target information with other uh, members of the fleet and commands ashore and even the Air Force overhead um, and do it in an encrypted way at high speed. High speed encryption is the key here. You can have a very secure signal that's very hard to decrypt and takes time, or you can have uh, Aegis Baseline 10 and do it rapidly for hundreds of targets while engaging them. 
Now, a SPI-6 uses increased space requiring uh, structural modification to the superstructure. So the, the Flight 3 looks a little bit different than the Flight 2 and 1 because they had to redesign how they mount these large arrays onto this little destroyer. And it also demands a much higher electrical load, so much so that the Navy replaced the, uh, the turbine generators with three Rolls-Royce MT-5S HE+ turbine generators just to keep the power flowing to this thing. And when combined with the ESM ECM SLQ32 version three, a uh, ESM or ECM so advanced that we literally can't talk about it. Like none of that is public right now, other than I had my channel had to take down a video because I with its electromagnetic force because it can. And they said that, well, because I explained how that happened, we weren't allowed to talk about that. All that is on this ship. It is very powerful. It has a very powerful ECM suite, which is used to defend the ship electromagnetically and a very long range SPY-6 radar that can share its information anywhere around the world encrypted and very fast. And it uses the TADIX-B, which is Tactical Data Information Exchange System, Bravo, which means that this is a great fleet command ship. They can control forces ashore, above, under the sea, all from this ship. No longer do you need the carrier or some kind of command vessel. While those are available, you could also do the same job just as well right here from the CIC of this ship. Let's talk about weapons. Well, the big thing about this ship is the VLS. The Mark 41 VLS is a egg crate, if you will, of all sorts of different missiles. You can put anything in this vertical launch system from a Tomahawk missile to the SM-2 Block 3 to the SM-6 surface-to-air missiles. Those things can shoot down anything from, you know, ballistic missiles to, uh, you know, sea-skimming cruise missiles at very long range. Um, and you have 32 cells on the bow. In front of that, you have the Mark 45 Mod 4 127 millimeter gun that can shoot, you know, out to 12, 15 miles reliably, putting 127 millimeter rounds on target quickly. Aft of the superstructure here, we have more Mark 41 VLS. Here we have a 64 cell, bringing the total count to about 96 VLS cells that can shoot anything from, like I said, the Tomahawk to a torpedo or any kind of surface to air missile uh, you would like to put on it. SM2, SM6 are the uh, are the most likely varieties to be on here. And we're gonna build, uh, like I said, we've ordered nine of these, we're gonna get 11, and we have torpedo tubes as well as a ASW helicopter on the back. Uh, to be fair to the ASW uh, helicopter, it's a multifunction helicopter, can do surface search, uh, replenishment at sea, multiple roles, but primarily from my point of view, it, it is an ASW uh, a threat. And she carries the torpedo tubes on board to help assist in that hunt and search. So let's break these down. How do these two ships compare head to head? The immense warhead on the SSN-19 shipwreck anti-ship cruise missile cannot be overstated. That thing will tear a ship apart and then it explodes. It's so big when it hits your ship, it's just gonna rip it in half. But it also has a very large warhead to complement all that kinetic energy. In the modern era, though, it is highly unlikely the SSN-19 anti-ship missile will ever get close to anything with Aegis Baseline 10. It's not even going to get in the realm that Kirov will probably be destroyed before it realizes it's in a fight. The Burke large magazine can carry a wide variety of weapons, so it brings both flexibility and capability to the fight. Kirov is shockingly vulnerable to damage. All of its fragile radars are topside and completely exposed to shrapnel damage or high explosive damage. Keeping with the battle cruiser theme, because that's what the Kirov was originally classified as, it has a maximum of 100 millimeter thickness on its deck plate, but its magazines that are below the deck are even less, have even thinner armor. So even the Burke's 127 millimeter cannon could pierce those magazines, ending a fight pretty damn fast. The Burke's SLQ-32 Seawit Block 3 ESM ECM suite can defeat anything that Peter the Great has, and I can't tell you why. I could just tell you that it will, and you'll have to take me on that one. More, it can make the ship appear in a completely different position. This is a modern capability of many of these EW suites, but 
what that results in is cruise missiles that are attacking a target will get to what they consider to be terminal range where they turn on their anti-ship search radar to try and find the target and they'll be nowhere near the ship. They will in most cases be beyond the target. So whenever the missile turns on its own search radar, it sees nothing. It certainly doesn't see the target. So that's just one of the many different capabilities the electronic warfare suite of the Burks and other ships uh, have in today's era. The Burke can get off the pier in about 20 minutes or less. Like I said, Peter the Great would take hours, uh, no matter what system it used, to get up to temperature and pressure to begin turning propellers to make underway. So the Burke would get to the fight, giving it a uh, tactical advantage. The Burke would be able to choose the time and place of the fight. It would also be able to dictate at what range the fight begins, giving it a uh, tactical advantage. Whenever you can control range rate, you control the fight in naval warfare. And the Burke would have all those advantages, including more weapons, uh, arguably more speed, even though publicly it's 25 knots. Um, the only thing I would give the Kirov class that Peter the Great is, uh, is endurance because they are nuclear powered. They can maintain 24 knots indefinitely, not damaged or until it breaks. And the Kirov is a menagerie of radars that instead of complementing each other, they conflict with each other when operated simultaneously despite being in different bands of the EW spectrum. You still get things like... Uh, beam forming and interference patterns on those beams and striping. Uh, there's a number of problems with the Kirov sensor suite when she lights off all the radars at once, which presumably in conflict, that would be the case. The Burke's Spy 6 Aegis Baseline 10 is the best naval sensor suite in the world and would easily overwhelm Peter the Great even in a one-on-one -on -one fight, being less than twice the size and tonnage. She carries more, faster, and is better. But there's another. All hope is not lost for ye Russians. There is a sister ship called Admiral Nakamov. In 1999, just after Peter the Great was commissioned, Admiral Nakamov went under repair, into refit is what we call it here in the United States but she never came out. Her refit decade after decade was funded and then canceled, the money taken back from the funding. Work never really began consistently until 2014, where funding was consistently applied to Admiral Nakamov in the shipyard for about 30 years now, 25 years. She continues to be worked on today. Uh, the weapon systems are being upgraded. She's getting three missile systems that are very concerning to anybody who would be an opponent of the, of the Russian Navy. First is the Onyx missile system. The second is the Zircon, and that is the hypersonic missile system that is both land attack and anti-ship. And then finally, the battle-tested caliber missile system is being added to this ship. And when this ship is finished, then she will be the most powerful ship or of any large combatant Navy in the world, hands down. And when that happens, we'll have to reevaluate this video. But for right now, the Arleigh Burke Flight 3 wins hands down. Just like I want you to win with today's sponsor, BetterHelp, click the link in the description or just go to betterhelp.com forward slash subbrief. You'll be glad you did. If you want more U.S. Navy comparison videos, check out this Virginia versus anything China has.